Please welcome President and Chief Executive Officer, Expedia, Mark Okerstrom, in discussion with Skift Executive Editor, Founding Editor, Dennis Schall. Hello there, Dennis. Hey, Mark. How are you? Thanks for being here. Great to be here. You guys came out of nowhere. And here you are, here we all are, like the unicorn of travel media. It's been a tremendous ride. Uh, I can't believe it. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here after the action-packed day uh, yesterday, whatever you did last night. Being here so early, Bloody Marys are on media later in the day. So, Mark, uh, anything going on at all? Uh, things been <laughs> slow at home? Any, business uh, as usual. You business know. as usual. Yeah. Uh, for anyone who you know hasn't been on the planet, Mark uh, and <laughs> it's not very many of you. Um, Mark started his job what September first? Yeah, when uh, Dara went to uh, Uber. That's right. Yeah. He did. He did. <laughs> yeah. Mark has been working at Expedia since 2006. Got it. Since 2011, he's been VP of Operations and CFO. I was impressed interviewing him over the years that he knows everything about the company, for, including how the search algorithm works. But, True. <laughs> so, Not um, everything. I've still got lots to learn, but I know a lot. I've done this scientific study, and I'm kind of figuring out what is the difference between being a CFO and CEO. So I don't know if you've noticed, over the years, Mark has gone to a lot of investor conferences. He's usually dressed like this. Yeah. And, but lately, if you've seen articles about him, he's rocking the coolness. He's wearing a hoodie all the time. It's true. You know? It's true. So, you know, I thought to help him in his transition, <laughs> I got him a skift hoodie. Oh, yeah. You know, here we go. This is, this is the only skift hoodie that exists, so. Let's see that thing. You no, know, so. Dude, that's amazing. Go for it, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> You're rocking kind of a hipster look there, too. I might have to just... I'm trying. I'm trying. You know, it's, it's, it's a perennial struggle. Yeah. Ex I got my Expedia socks on, too. Uh, it's it's Skiff Yellow, also, yeah. so that's Expedia pretty cool. Expedia Yellow. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> so I was speaking to you last week over the phone. Yeah. And I don't know if you were joking or not, but I asked you, um, what, did, you know, what advice did Barry Diller give you? Yeah. And you said, do it faster and do it better. Yeah. So I don't know if you were joking, but what does he want you to do faster? What does he want you to do better? And you know, there's a lot of continuity in what you're doing, but what is it that you want to do different uh, than the previous yeah. regime? Well, I think, first of all, the previous regime was, I was a big part of it. So, um, you know, there, there really isn't a long list of things that I want to do differently from, from a strategic perspective. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, listen, we've just got an amazing opportunity ahead of us. Over the course of the last, you know, really four or five years, we have absolutely transform, transformed this company, um, both through mergers and acquisitions, whether it's Travago, whether it's HomeAway, Travelocity, Orbitz, What If, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, most recently Silver Rail, Traveloka, but also organically. I mean, we have replatformed uh, these, these iconic brands, brand Expedia, Hotels.com, and modern technology platforms. Uh, we've gone from a world where we were high-priced merchant hotel only to you know, basically market pricing on merchant and agency with a much more bidded marketplace. And I think we're very much in the early stages. It, it, it actually blows my mind that you know, one of the largest travel companies in the world, if not the largest travel company in the world, us, with over $80 billion of bookings, uh, in a $1.4 trillion industry, it's like 6% share. All right. It's incredible. So, a lot you know, of room to grow. There's a lot of room to go. So you know, better, faster is about us pushing out our borders, being locally relevant on a global basis, everywhere we operate. It's going to take some time, but we're going to absolutely do that. Being more customer-centric, and as an organization, just, just moving faster. Talking about pushing out the borders, um, I understand you opened a new development center recently. Can we you did. talk about that? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, we're super excited about it. Um, we opened up a development center in Jordan 
Uh, we are one of the first, uh, you know, real large internet companies to open up there. Uh, we opened it up earlier uh, this summer. Uh, we got about 50 engineers there. Uh, it's 50-50, men and women, so achieve gender balance right out of the gate. And I think it's just an example of what we can do as, like, honestly, a global community when we take down some of these barriers of prejudice and bigotry and narrow-mindedness and open our hearts to, you know, what is available around this world, um, what we can all achieve. And we're absolutely thrilled with our Jordan Development Center. Uh, we hope to make it bigger, and we hope that we can be, you know, ultimately uh, an example for other tech companies around the world. That's pretty awesome. Another border question. Uh, <laughs> uh, our president. Uh, I wasn't expecting this question. I know. Um, he issued a new travel ban, yeah. um, you know, in the last few days. And uh, Dara was uh, from Iran. I think he arrived here as a kid. Yep. You're from Canada. Yep. Um, what do you think of the new travel ban? Do you intend to be, you know, outspoken on the issue? Well, I was happy not to see Canada on the list, uh, for start, so um, it's not all bad. Uh, you know, listen, I, uh, you know, I think, first of all, um, you know, obviously we take national security very seriously, and I think that that is an issue, but there are ways to go about doing this. And, you know, from, from my perspective, you know, when you look at what we've done with Jordan, when you look at what happens when people travel the world and experience the people as opposed to the reputation. Um, that's what's gonna bring us together. So a ban on travel from our perspective is a bad thing for the world. Um, obviously a ban on travel is a bad thing for us as a company, but you know, importantly, you know, it's not just a ban on you know, these seven countries, seven or eight countries. Uh, it's what it says to the world. Um, one in nine people in this country are reliant on travel and tourism for their livelihood. Uh, the tour, tour, tourism industry generates hundreds of billions of dollars of economic activity in this country. And to the extent that we are advertising the world, no vacancy, that's a bad thing for this country. Sure. Uh, in the last go around, Expedia, I believe, uh, joined some of the litigation against the travel ban. Do you yeah. intend to do that again? Well, we're still taking a look at, at the particulars. I think that was a very specific situation where the way that it was done was just, you know, not legal. Uh, and I think that to the extent we're in that situation, it's something that we'll think about, but it's still pretty early. People are going through it right now. Uh, we talked about the development center. Um, you know, so obviously you're um, keyed in on emerging technologies. So what do you think is going to happen in the next five years that you're either excited about or afraid about? Mm -hmm. regarding new platforms, technology? Yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, it's mostly excitement unless we don't move with the trend. Um, and our, we plan to move with the trend. In fact, we, we plan to, to lead it. I think there are two important developments uh, from my perspective that could really change this industry over the course of the next uh, you know, th three to five years. Uh, I think one is just personalization. I think that you know, where we are getting to in terms of just the, the vast amounts of data that we have, our ability to truly understand and know our customers, uh, I think gives us the opportunity uniquely to just get into a, a state where we can just personalize our offering. You know, the first phase in online travel was really taking that green screen that the travel agent used to have, turning it around and saying, the power to research and book is yours. Enjoy it. And you know, I think for the most part, we're still stuck in that state. But one of the other things that travel agents did so expertly is they said, Dennis, I know you love that Ritz-Carlton. I know you love it. You know, it Four Seasons is also great as well. Why don't you try <laughs> them? And are you going to go back to Maui this year like you did last year? That true customer centricity I think that you know, big data and, and all the things that we're doing, uh, machine learning will help us get to personalization uh, better, and I think that will happen over the course of the next three to five years, and we expect to be a leader in that space. I think the second place that is interesting for us is voice. Um, you know, I think if you look at what happened with mobile, which was the last big thing, um, and you know, it still is a big thing, 
The interesting thing about it is that it actually changed people's behavior. Suddenly now, people are spending a lot more time researching travel because they've got their device with them. Suddenly, they're much more willing to book something last minute because they're at the nightclub and why not just stay at a hotel tonight? It actually changed customers' behavior and I think that it'll be interesting to see whether voice is you know, the same, you know, has the same impact. And I think it's a little bit early to tell. Um, you know, right now, obviously, we're experimenting with chatbots, which, you know, for me is a step towards voice. Uh, predominantly, it's, you know, it's customer service, but I could definitely see a world where um, we get to a spot where through your, you know, for your Echo, Alexa, for through your Google Home, Siri on your phone, um, you know, Microsoft Cortana, something with Facebook, you're actually going to be able to book travel in a real meaningful way and research travel, at least starting with voice. And we think that's really interesting. Great. I forgot to mention to you, if you want to act, ask Mark questions later, go to slido.com or the uh, Skift app and put your questions in and we'll ask, ask them in the last five minutes. Um, on another uh, new technology, um, blockchain. So yeah. I was out with this airline guy last night and by the way, if a reporter ever tells you they were out with an airline guy last night, there really isn't an airline guy, but we wanted to tee up the question. Anyway, <laughs> the airline guy told me that the global distribution systems have been um, the albatross around innovation and travel distribution over the last de few decades. Wow. Um, and that his theory was that Expedia and Priceline are happy about this Status quo and travel, st status quo and travel distribution, because you guys are at the top of the food chain there. Mm -hmm. So, what about blockchain? Is that a threat to you guys? Because there could be new entrants. There's a low barrier, or how do you view it? Well, one, I think it's just way too early to tell. I think, listen, what what does blockchain do? Well, blockchain generally is replacing intermediaries in situations where a thing can only be in one place. If I give you money, I gotta make sure that you got it. I no longer have it. That gets done by escrow agents, you know, right now in real estate tra uh, transactions. Um, in the case of inventory, if Expedia books that flight, we gotta make sure that no one else has got that. So, you know, that is essentially, right now, the application of blockchain. It's been used in cryptocurrencies predominantly right now. Is there an application in inventory systems? I think potentially. I think for it to ultimately be a disruptor, I think one of two things has to be the case. I think it has to be either cheaper or it has to be better. And I think we're not quite in a spot yet where we know the answer to uh, either, either of those questions. Uh, we were an early adopter with Bitcoin. Uh, we've got teams that are looking at the possibilities of blockchain. Uh, I don't view it as a, uh, right now, a th as a threat to us, although I'm constantly paranoid about everything. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it could be a factor, but I think it's way too early right now to tell whether it can be cheaper and importantly, you know, can it, can it be better? Right. On HomeAway, um, that's a big bet for Expedia. Um, you're counting on HomeAway for a lot of growth. You, you announced that you had a goal of uh, 350 million EBITDA by next year. When I spoke with you on the phone recently, it sounded like there was a little wiggle room in that number <laughs> and that perhaps, you know, you're, you're doing budget planning. Did I wiggle? I don't know if I wiggled. Well, little wiggle. got that sense. So, so what is happening with that? Are you going to meet yeah. that goal? And well, we haven't updated it. We're in the middle of 2018 planning right now for that business. Um, you know, listen, HomeAway is a jewel of an asset. And that whole space of alternative accommodations is so large and growing so quickly. There's so much traveler interest in it. There's so much supplier interest in it. Uh, HomeAway has not actively been trying to aggressively add new properties to the platform, but since we bought them, they've added something like half a million. You know, now they got 1.5 million listings that are online bookable. Well, you're not ready to add? Uh <laughs> Well, listen, I think, I think the big focus right now has been, and we've been very clear about it, is hey, let's just get all of this activity that's already happening by virtue of the HomeAway platform on the platform. Um, but it just works, you know? More people are coming to the platform on the, the traveler side, more people from the supply side. And so, listen, we're really excited about it. The team there is doing phenomenal. The amount of change that they have uh, actually executed in such a short period of time 
is remarkable. And so when we look at the, you know, the $350 million target, which by the way we gave at the end of 2015, like that's like eons ago right. in, in the travel world, you know, we're gonna be looking at you know, essentially could we overperform it? Could we underperform it? What's the right thing to do given the opportunities that HomeAway has uh, ahead of us? And you know, over the course of the next three to six months here, we'll have an answer for that. And then there's a company called Airbnb. Mm -hmm. So I think HomeAway, you've heard of them. I've heard of them, yeah. Uh, I think HomeAway has about one million instantly bookable properties. Yeah. Airbnb, I think, has twice that. Yeah. Airbnb is the cool guy in the room. Come it's on. the unicorn. Home, when I think of home away, I think of families, older people. How do you get that youthful millennial vibe into vacation rentals? And, <laughs> and don't you need to? You must love it, you know, older people. You know. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's a really good judge of personality, <laughs> let me tell you. Listen, home away is, it's, it's getting hip. It's getting happy. Yeah. I think, um, listen. There is no question that in 2015, HomeAway was doing the same thing generally that they had been doing for the last 10 years. And, um, but HomeAway's changed. HomeAway has absolutely changed. Now, do they have inventory that generally older people, uh, <laughs> many he with- He said he was gonna dish back, many, I see that. Many with, with big <laughs> families would like to stay at. Yeah, they have amazing properties, like absolutely amazing properties that old people and young people with friends can go to. Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the start of it. That's their heritage. Where they will go is they will go to more urban. They will go to more international. And I think you know that is phase two and phase three. We're very much at the early stages of this. Um, we, think the, we think that the market is massive. We think the world of Airbnb and what they've done. I mean, that team has just done remarkable, uh, remarkable work. I think they've opened the world's eyes to the, you know, the, the, the real value you can get from alternative accommodations. And I think that um, HomeAway is very much looking forward to stepping in alongside them and going after this opportunity for many, many years to come. It's interesting that um, you seem to be taking a different approach than Booking.com in the sense that if you're looking for a hotel or uh, an apartment on Booking.com, you see everything all at once. Mm -hmm. When you're on Expedia, it's my understanding, you have to be searching for you know five days here or seven days before the vacation yeah. rentals um, show up. Yeah. So who's doing the right thing? I mean, why do you take that approach rather than yeah. Well, I think we are experimenting right now. I mean, right now we're doing that because we're trying to find the old people looking for a you know, place <laughs> to stay with their family. I'll stop saying that. No, that's okay. That's three that's times. Okay. Sorry, it's too much. Um, when, I'm, when I'm at the office, I, I write down my age rather than say it because I can't really say it anymore. So, <laughs> um, so we're, we're in experimentation mode. I mean, as it relates to HomeAway, you know, they're kind of going the other way. I mean, HomeAway has actually got all the alternative accommodations, and then they're actually bringing in uh, instantly bookable hotel-like properties alongside, and you can actually see everything together. On Expedia, we've just got to be a little bit more careful uh, because we do have such a broad selection of uh, hotel inventory, and we want to make sure, again, to this point of we want to show you the right properties at the right time and not make your life more difficult. Life's complex enough. We want to make sure that we're smart about that. And we are, a, you know, an experimentation, test and learn culture, and I have no question that we'll, we'll get to the right spot on that. Is part of it about not wanting to piss off your hotel partners? I noticed that uh, there's this organization called the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Mm, heard of them too. You've heard of them. Yeah. Uh, and they say you're part of the duopoly, that <laughs> you are, you and the Priceline group, yeah. um, you dominate the hotel world, yeah. you're hurting competition for consumers, and you're hurting hotel owners. What, what do you think of that yeah. argument? Well, listen, I mean, single digit percent of an industry last time I checked does not make a duopoly when there's two of them at. So I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's hyperbole. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's right. Um, you know, I think, listen, to your, to your original question, I, I think that from, at least from what we can tell, 
there are actually you know, only few situations where there is real cannibalization of hotel business by alternative accommodations. In many cases, it's just you know, completely separate use cases. And you know, I think that there is a great opportunity for hoteliers to do a much better job at things like bringing situations where you have adjoining rooms online so you can actually book them together being much better at you know, displaying inventory that they have that, that has a kitchen, that has multiple rooms, and actually putting themselves in a spot where they can actually shut down some of these reasons why people choose alternative accommodations. People go with big groups, people go with families. When I w wanna go somewhere, God, I'd love to book an adjoining room. Can I do it online? No. So then I look for an alternative accommodations because the last thing I wanna do is actually talk to someone on the phone. I don't wanna do that. I hear you. Yeah. You do have a certain amount of market power, though. Um, we estimated that, that we think you're gonna spend about, um, let's see, about 2.9 billion this year, somewhere around there, in, just in digital advertising. Uh, Booking.com, Priceline Group's probably gonna spend about 4.3 billion. Did I say million? It's billion. Um, gotcha. How can hotels compete? They're doing their direct booking campaigns. Yeah. Uh, they're spending a lot of money, but you know, on that, but it's, it's probably a fraction of what you guys are spending. So how can they compete, and are they hurting you at all? Well, listen, I think compete's an interesting world. I mean, we're, we don't view us uh, as being a competitor to the big, the big hotels, I think the, the, or the small hotels. I think the way that hotels compete is they compete against each other. Listen, we're, we are a platform. We have 435,000 hotel properties. There's 600 million visitors that visit our sites every single month. We have, I think, 1,050 hotels here in New York. The largest chain has less than 100. Uh, we're just in different businesses. So when you ask me how hotels to compete can compete, ultimately, they give consumers, travelers, business, leisure, groups, amazing experiences. They go on to Expedia, not unlike we go on to Google, we acquire customers that are agnostic about where they stay, because otherwise they'd already be on the big chain's websites. You know, less than half a percent of Hotels.com search volume is looking for you know, one of the biggest chain by name. So it's truly agnostic customers. They need to learn how to optimize into that channel, and then when they get a customer from Expedia, you know, they can be very innovative, like Red Lion, who is actually working with us to sign that customer up to their rewards program. But if they're not willing to do that, go into the channel, get as much volume as you possibly can, give them an amazing experience when they get onto your property, sign up to the loyalty program, so the next time, they come back to you directly. And even if they don't, the next time, they book your hotel as opposed to someone else's. So I think we just need to shift the dialogue. I think we're in totally different businesses. I think we offer an amazing platform where people can target incredibly incremental and different demand they can get on their own. And I think that's the way this, this has to go. Speaking of Google, they just got slapped with, uh, I think maybe a 2.7 billion fine in Europe. Uh, there's a hint that they're gonna start that the EU is gonna start focusing on their uh, travel business practice. Do you welcome that? And would you like to see the DOJ uh, take another look at, at Google in the US? Well, I think, you know, first of all, uh, Google's a great partner of ours. And I think Google has, has done a wonderful job taking, like, not only just hotel agnostic, but truly everything agnostic consumers and sorting them out into places where we can actually go and acquire those new customers. I think it's been a great catalyst for our business. I think it's been a great catalyst for our competitors' business. Um, and in that respect, uh, we are great partners. But listen, we do have situations where uh, they uh, use, it seems like, their power position uh, in the overall ecosystem to do things as, you know, that this is what they do, but to do things that are adverse to advertisers, and in some cases, consumers. And I think in situations where they're doing that, I think regular, regulatory oversight is entirely appropriate. Great. We do have some audience questions. Is Hotel Tonight on your M&A watch list? <laughs> uh, listen, everything's on our M&A watch list. You know us by now. Um, 
I think, I think Sam Shank and that team have built a really beautiful product. Um, and, you know, I, I, think, I think the question for us is, you know, is something like that additive to what we are already doing? I mean, we have been very disciplined in our acquisition strategy. It's got to make strategic sense. It's got to make financial sense. Um, to the extent that we were in a situation where those two things check the box for Hotel Tonight, I think we'd be interested, but it's certainly not on our must-have list. Hotels.com and Expedia have amazing last-minute inventory, um, and it's not only for tonight, it's for tomorrow, and, and the, the next, next day, 120 and the days. next day, and the next day after that. So is it on a nice-to-have list? I think it's on a, you know, Sam, let's have a beer and talk about it list. Sam, you hear that? <laughs> hey, Sam. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on the tours and activities space? Mm. And are you, uh, Steve Kaufer is going to speak, be speaking um, later today, and no. TripAdvisor sees it as a, the next $1 billion business, I believe. So are you pursuing tours and activities aggressively enough? No, we're not pursuing it aggressively enough is the short answer. Um, you know, little known fact, I mean, we are actually one of the largest activities uh, distributors on the planet in terms of online. Uh, we do hundreds of millions of dollars of, of activities, bookings, uh, growing very quickly. Uh, predominantly, it has come in the form of us uh, taking our activities from, I think, over 25,000, 30,000 different suppliers and offering it to Expedia customers who are purchasing their flight and purchasing their hotel. It's predominantly been an add-on type purchase. Now, I think that with mobile, uh, it has opened our eyes and caused us to want to at least look at whether we do become more aggressive. I mean, the, the, the perfect experience, obviously, because we know where you know, lots of people are traveling to. Last year, we did 15 billion flight searches. We know where people are going. Uh, we have, I think, over 180 million cumulative app downloads. We're on their phone. Um, why not pop them an offer for a bus tour or a scuba lesson? I think it's a huge opportunity for us. So I think you may see us incrementally get a little bit more uh, serious about that space. Uh, it's always been number four on a list of three. And I think that going forward, uh, it, you know, it'll move up the prioritization list or it'll be a list of four. We have a minute left here. Um, there's a certain company in Latin America called Despegar yes. that just did an IPO. You guys are an investor. Mm -hmm. uh, do you plan on acquiring them eventually? Well, I don't think uh, that we need to. I think we've got a very strong presence in Latin America. Brand Expedia is building. You know, every year they just get stronger. Uh, Hotels.com, every year they get stronger. Our Expedia affiliate network business is doing very well there. Our Agencia, you know, the fourth largest corporate travel business in the world is doing well there. Uh, Travago is doing well there. So, you know, like all of these things, it is, uh, you know, not on a must-have list. In fact, we're at the point where there really isn't anything that's on a must-have list. Uh, but listen, we're huge fans of the, the Despegar team. They've built an amazing business in a region which is incredibly complicated to do business in. Uh, we're thrilled to see their IPO was a success. We're thrilled with our investment. Uh, we are, uh, you know, honored to be a partner with them on the supply uh, inventory side. But like anything, to the extent there's a strategic and a financial match, we're interested in talking to everyone. So it's a definite maybe. <laughs> definite maybe. You got it. We're out of time. Thank you very, yeah. very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>